Good morning, everybody. And I understand there is a little stress involved in your line of work. Am I correct? Just a little. Well, unlike many people who are involved in treating stress, I see it in the real world. Being as I'm a medical doctor, I spent years in the emergency department of a busy hospital witnessing the effects of stress on people who did not suspect it. I've come to view stress a little bit like an odorless gas that's in the air that could pose great danger to the slightest spark in your business. And yet, uh, if you know what's going on, you know how to avoid it. Uh, it. One of the things about stress is that it is odorless and it may not strike uh, strike you as being the least bit obvious. You may think, well, that's not me. I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Stress is part of the job, don't you know? Can't possibly get me, but it can. And I've seen it happen to the most unsuspecting people. In the midst of a very important project, all of a sudden their health is hit. It doesn't necessarily mean heart attacks. It could be any part of your body could break down, whatever the weak link is. And I've seen it all. I've seen the stomach ulcer in cases where that's the weak link. I've seen the chest pain or ultimately the heart attack in those uh, cases. And sometimes it's just a question of circuit overload in the brain. Uh, when people have uh, mental breakdowns or efficiency breakdowns, anxiety, depression, that sort of thing, uh, we refer to that in the medical business as brain barf, actually. But what it boils down to is that something in your body might break. And just like that odorless gas that's in the air lurking as a potential danger for those who aren't aware of it and light up a, a, a cigarette or uh, make, make any kind of a scratching noise with metal uh, against metal and start a spark, stress can do nothing to you. And you think you're getting away with it, and all of a sudden, bang. So it behooves all of us to not ignore the stress, but to finally get a close-up look at it from the real world. And stress isn't something that only happens during bad times. Canada's original pioneer, and I am from Canada, but his, the original pioneer in stress work was Dr. Hans Selye. And Dr. Selye defined stress as the adaptation of our bodies to any change, adaptation of our minds as well. But any change means not just bad news. So stress can occur during good times. Ask anybody that's just delivered triplets. Terrific change in their lives. Whoa, my gosh, but very stressful. It's not only the obvious bad news. So even if you haven't had funerals or anything disastrous in your, uh, in your recent past, you can still be having stress with a big promotion, moving to a new house, uh, even if it's a nicer house. Your body doesn't know. It only knows that everything is different. And commonly in your line of work, you do have to move. I've lived in five of Canada's 10 provinces, so I know what it's like to relocate, have to meet new friends, integrate the kids with school, and so forth. All of that is something that I grew up with, and it's all something that can either be taken one way or the other. Either you get depressed about it, or you get sick about it, or just ignore it and think it's not having a, any effect on everybody's relationships. Or you can realize that it can also be a very positive thing. Now, the stress is only a neutral. When a television light goes on, and I did some, as Matthias said, I've done a lot of um, uh, work in uh, the entertainment business. When I was 14, I was doing live stand-up comedy monologues on television three nights a week uh, in a small town in Canada. But one of the things that I noticed is that when people came on the air, the red light goes on on the camera. Now, that red light is neutral light. And when you te tear off a tear sheet, back in those days we had to do that, of a brand new bulletin that might be occurring, what happens is that you hand it to the announcer, and he, he or she will read that to absolute perfection, not a flaw. If you had handed it to them in the hallway where there was no particular pressure, they'd probably make all kinds of mistakes. On the other hand, that same red light that brings out excellence in somebody that's trained for that line of work, like the curtain, curtain going up for a trained actor, that same red light brings out total abject panic in people that aren't prepared for it. They suddenly you see the red light go on, oh my God, the most intelligent person in the world can suddenly forget his or her mother tongue. And all they do is uh, uh, they freeze in front of that same red light. Now how can that be? How can that one red light bring out excellence or bring out complete catastrophe? And the answer is it's exactly the same as stress. It has nothing to do with the red light. It has nothing to do with the stress. It has everything to do with who that stress lands on. And in medicine, the real trick in the art of medicine, it's an art and a science, there's a lot of analysis, and I know you have a lot of analysis right to, uh, that's similar to medicine, including MRIs that we have as well. Only yours are of the ground. So I guess that means you guys are better grounded than we are. But nonetheless, there's a lot of analysis that goes into, this, into medicine, just like there is in your business. But in the end, 
It's not that hard to figure out what kind of a disease a person has. The trick is what kind of a person does that disease have. So what kind of a uh, person does this stress have makes all the difference. Because stress is not a killer. Now, there are stressful things that are horrible. We understand that. Wartime, loss of a loved one. My mother died uh, about eight months ago. And that was a, an incredibly stressful time, uh, even though she was 84. There are people who have lost a child, which is out of sequence. That's also very stressful. We just had a horrible hurricane uh, coming up to a year ago, Katrina, and people lost everything, including lives and homes, and, and the whole uh, of, of their lives was turned upside down. There is nothing joyful, joyful about that kind of stress, quite clearly. What we are talking about is the fact that Remember, it's, it's not the stress that's going to make the difference. It's who the stress lands upon. And even with wartime disasters, and even with the most severe stresses, some people manage to carry on, and some don't. Some crumble. And it's my role as a, a medical doctor to try and treat them all and try and sort out the lessons we can learn from the people that do it right, as well as from the people that have done it incorrectly. This was brought home to me when I had a speech to do in Tampa. I live in Denver right now. And I did a speech uh, a few years ago. Tampa had, <coughs> there, there had a problem. There was a storm. An epicenter was right in Tampa or St. Pete's. And all the airlines were shut down. I had no ability to make my speech at 9 o'clock the next morning other than to charter what turned out to be the last available private airplane left in Denver that could make that flight, a two-engine small plane. I have a bit of a fear of flying in small planes, at least. I'm not much used to it. Um, I was worried about this one because when we took off, it was going extremely slowly. I noticed that all the, all the bird strikes were on the back of the wing. It's not a, not a good sign. Um, there were two people flying the thing. There was a pilot and a co-pilot. Um, they didn't seem to be all that experienced. We had to stop five times through the night between Denver and Tampa, three times for fuel and, and, and twice for directions. Um, but. <laughs> It was a concern. Um, we stopped in, in Mississippi, and I remember there was a, a very suspicious uh, Versa food machine that was selling alleged food. And um, I was concerned because all the sandwiches had sort of curled up and they had sort of pathology specimens in uh, bologna or whatever it is. I'm not partial to animal lips, um, but nonetheless, that's what they were serving. The pilot and co-pilot each had something to eat. I did not. I thought, I'm not doing this. We took off from Jackson, Mississippi, and it just dawned on me at that moment. I thought, it's crystal clear. I know what's going to happen. They're going to both have food poisoning, and I'm going to be thrust into the cockpit to fly this thing. Oh, my gosh. I had a quick look at, with renewed interest in the cockpit to see what might be my option here. I looked in the cockpit, and I, I saw the switches and dials and all of these lights flashing and the whole bit. And I knew right then what would happen. It was very clear. I would die of cardiac spasm before we augured into the ground because I had no idea what I would be doing. I had no training. But what would have happened had I just come out of six months of flight training school with simulation devices, and I'd had lessons, I'd had six hours of solo time in that exact same cockpit. I would have been reassured. Those switches and dials would have been my friend. They would have been perfect. Now I know what to do. I know what the rotating bandersnatch is. I know what the trim is. I know how to fix things. I can't control the storms that might be up ahead. That would be impossible for any pilot. But wouldn't you want to put your money on somebody that knows what's going on inside that cockpit? That's where I want my body to be. Most people do not know that your body is far more complicated than the cockpit of that airplane. But nobody ever tells you how to fix it or what's in it, how to run it. And that's what you're going to learn here today. It's not to avoid stress, because that's frankly idiotic. It'll never happen, and it shouldn't happen. You don't want somebody coming into an organization as high-powered, high intellectual power, high energy, and, uh, and, and high challenge as you have here in this line of work. Someone coming in and saying, uh, stress, forget it. We want more work balance time with, uh, with your, with your playtime and all of that, and just, why don't you just all go home at 4.30 and, and goof off, and just sort of sink into a hot bath for the entire rest of the evening. That's not an answer to stress. Because the stress that's out there is actually your friend, and it's going to help you achieve better things than any of you would ever achieve. We all know that if you want something done, you ask the busy person. But we also know that if you want something done quickly, you don't necessarily ask someone who's on a permanent government grant. What's the work ethic of a spoiled rich kid that gets too big an allowance every week? 
zero. The whole idea is to have stress as your ally, but know that you have the same switches and dials as the cockpit of an airplane has that you're going to learn how to use here today to be able to adjust the trim. You cannot control the storms. We all know there could be a personal tragedy or a, a hurricane waiting for us, and the things that we can't control, that's obvious. But we want to put our money on somebody who has informed knowledge of what's going on inside. 